I know you'll want to head to LaGrange to see it all for yourself. Until June 29th, the Texas Quilt Museum features butterfly art quilts and a collection of rare antique quilts. Should be fun for the gardeners, too. Find out more at texasquiltmuseum.org. Right now we're going to be talking about the stuff underneath our feet, the soil, and joining us is one of Austin's dirt doctors is George Altgelt from uh, uh, GeoGrowers, and it's great to have you on the program again, George. It's Welcome. great to be back. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we are talking about uh, the very fundamental piece of the garden, the most fundamental piece of the garden, which is the soil. And uh, it seems to me that in these drought times uh, where we've only had one or rainfall, and at least in my garden this year, it's actually penetrated to the ground, that the, 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 it would seem to me that the life of the soil is imperiled in that kind of situation. It is imperiled, and especially if you start to lose your moisture due to a lack of cover, either mm -hmm. from vegetation or from a lack of not mulching. Mm -hmm. uh, once you lose your cover, the soil gets hot. The, whole, the heat will stop you from holding enough uh, water, which is your nitrogen holding capacity, and it's also the fluid medium in which the little microbes and mycelia of fungi live mm -hmm. and operate. Right, and we'll get into talking about fungi because I, I know that you want to do that. It's because one of the most fundamental pieces of the soil. Let's talk a little bit more about keeping the ground cool. Obviously, we can use mulch. Um, uh, what In most settings, what are you re kinds of mulch do you recommend to people? Well, there are two kinds. One is the shredded hardwood. Mm -hmm. You can put it on nice and thick. Uh, it shows off green because of its dark color. Mm -hmm. Landscapers choose that a lot. But a new one emerging in great popularity is the chipped cedar. It's much lighter in color and it's got a longer life because the particles are more coarse mm -hmm. and the light color keeps it reflecting light rather than absorbing light. It also smells pretty good too. It smells great. <laughs> it smells great in the garden. and. Uh, you, you talked about <laughs> nitrogen holding capacity. Let's talk a, a little bit more about why that's important. And the uh, question is, is it important to supplement with nitrogen? It is important to supplement with nitrogen. And nitrogen, of course, is the building block of all proteins. Mm -hmm. Everything you've got from your vegetable garden to the fruit trees to the leaves on your ornamentals are made of protein. Mm -hmm. And that's what sticks it all together. So you've got to have enough nitrogen. Plant has to have access to nitrogen. That's a function of the moisture in the soil and how cool it is. That keeps the moisture there. And then the plants take it up and you know, assemble it into amino acids and then the larger building blocks from there. Okay, all right. Now, uh, we always th uh, talk about the soil as this kind of ecosystem with lots of living things. One of the things that people get in their, their soil and scratch around they might see threads of white or what looks like mold. And I know that in most cases, people f panic when they see that. Should they? No, they shouldn't. Uh, and they do panic. I get lots of questions regarding that. This is the mycelial mat that is so integral to a uh, healthy functioning you know, fungal contingent. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, the fungus is actually in a symbiosis with the roots of your plants, whether right. it's a fruit tree or uh, you know, a pepper plant. And this is really fascinating because in a sense, the, the fungi act as, uh, you used the word scouts when we were talking earlier, as scouts for the roots of the plants. Yes. Now yes. tell me how that works. Okay, I have been fortunate enough to see a film of a fungal mat scouting out ahead of the roots in a situation where there was a plant growing uh, up against a glass uh, barricade okay. so you could film this. Mm -hmm. The fungal mat goes out and it's done in time lapse so you can see the actual growth taking place and right behind it, following the major veins of that fungus, is the plant's roots. Now what's going on? Okay. Well, well you tell me. <laughs> All right. All right. It's symbiosis. Okay. What the fungus gets is uh, sugars and moisture from the tree roots. Mm -hmm. And what the tree gets is where to go to find the minerals required to grow all of these things. Okay. And, the, and in some cases they're finding amino acids, the fungus, mm -hmm. and in some cases they're finding minerals. 
Okay. But it's a, it's a wonderful partnership, and they are so efficient when they work together. It's amazing how Mother Nature works. It's always like a you know, lock and a key, isn't it? It's it like... is. <laughs> it is. So when you see a fungal mat, don't freak out, because okay. in all likelihood, it's beneficial. There are very, very few pathogenic funguses mm -hmm. that are going to cause problems. Yeah. Now, when I prepare new planting beds, I often will turn in... Uh, agricultural molasses, the dry molasses, because I'm, I've been led to believe that's beneficial for the fungi. Is, is that accurate? That's accurate, and not just the fungi. There are bacterium and bacteria that eat the molasses, mm -hmm. and, you know, for them, it's party time, because they're <laughs> adapted to eating sugars. Mm -hmm. Plants exude sugars. Uh, through the exudates that are coming out of the roots. Mm -hmm. This is no new thing for uh, both microbes and funguses. Mm -hmm. And that turns into uh, spent metabolites coming from them, which are further food down the chain of the food web, the soil food web, and everybody else is dining on everything that's not being used. And it's a marvelous system. And when you input molasses, you're stoking the fire from the beginnings all the way through to the end of all these biochemical pathways that exist. Interesting. It's, I, I, I'm endlessly fascinated by all of this stuff. Now, let's, let's talk about uh, specialty kinds of situations. Um, I know that a lot of people out there are experimenting right now with, for example, creating orchards in their backyard, of planting lots of fruit trees, things like that. Let's take that as a particular. Um, if somebody has a invested in fruit trees and wants to do the right thing by them in terms of soil, what's appropriate? Okay, what's appropriate? Now I want to offer this immediately. Everyone should know this. The conventional wisdom is to plant the tree in whatever comes out of the hole. Mm -hmm. Some places in the country, that's good advice. Around here, not good advice. <laughs> okay. What's coming out of that hole is caliche and, ch and rock chips. Mm -hmm. Not a good growing medium for trees. If you're growing an apple tree, it's certain death because of the cotton root rot, mm -hmm. which is rampant anytime this alkalinity problem shows up. What you want to plant an apple tree in and some of the other more sensitive trees is uh, you want to plant it in something like geotree mix or anything except caliche because it's so severely alkaline you cannot harbor the proper microbes to keep that plant standing in good stead mm -hmm. with an ecosystem that spreads with its roots. Now you, you used a, a, a phrase of a commercial mix that you make, a, a, a geotree mix. Now what are yes. the components of that? It's made out of decomposed granite and uh, Texas Department of Transportation certified pathogen-free mm -hmm. cow compost, okay. which comes from dairy manure, and it's a uh, very good material to use. There's no pathogens in it because mm -hmm. of the high temperature at which it's composted. Okay. And this is monitored. Uh, in any event, it turns out to be a very good growing medium for trees, and it's a great way to grow apple trees around here, which mm -hmm. in the past has been pretty difficult. Yeah, and uh, I, I find Everything seems to love to grow in the granite sand. I don't know what it is. <laughs> Maybe you know. <laughs> yes, I actually tested the geotree mix on a mango tree, okay. which is traditionally an, uh, likes a neutral to acid soil. Mm -hmm. And the tree mix has a pH of 8.2. And this mango tree is growing every year. It gets bigger inside of my greenhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't you know, find a better example of growing a mango anywhere in Austin, Texas. All right. Well, just real quick final advice, George, for people with vegetable gardens. Here we are on the onset of the really hot months. What should people be doing now to they protect their soil? Thick mulch. And remember, you pull the mulch back, you work the soil if you need to, you add your fertilizers to the soil, and then you put the mulch right back on top to protect it from the heat. Mm -hmm. There's a lighter colored mulch right now that's doing very well. It's the chipped cedar. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a long life because of the coarse particles, but right. it's light in color, so it reflects a lot of light rather than absorbing it right. and stays cooler. All right, well, George, it's always fascinating to visit with you. I learned so much about all the different components of the life underneath our feet, which is really uh, where all gardens start and it's the most important piece of gardening. Uh, so thank you for sharing your information with us. You're so welcome. All right, and coming up next, it's our friend Daphne.